What's coming up is free. There's a whole world of even better stuff for our Patreon supporters. Go to patreon.com slash word in your ear to see how you can join them. Word down your way. Those who are about to tour salute you. Welcome to another edition of Word Down Your Way. People about to go on tour talking about uh, the first and uh, best things they've ever seen on stage. And I'm delighted to say, it's very thrilling, that we're joined by the self-declared bargain basement Baudelaire himself, the great John Cooper Clark. John, it's lovely to see you. Nice to see you, Mark. Where do we, fi- where do we find you? Uh, we're at Broadcasting House, Portland Place. Oh, yeah, you're doing a, a, a whirlwind day of publicity, aren't you? That's right. Fantastic. I'm well, look, I thought I'd have a range of microphones like Fidel Castro <laughs> speaking to the world. Yeah, oh, yeah. You know, I'm very disappointing. I'm so, very... look, what we <laughs> tend to do is go back to um, your very first memories of people. And your wonderful memoir that came out last stage, I want to be uh, last year, I want to be yours, has all sorts of details about you going to see. Gigs, I think, am I right, about the age of 11, you were going to see all sorts of people? Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah, about 11. And my first, uh, the first uh, famous person I saw on stage was uh, Bob Hope. Yeah? Yeah. How did, how did that happen? Big fan of his. And uh, he, was, uh, he, he was doing a personal show, a personal appearance at the Palace Theatre in Manchester, uh, where, where I come from. And... Um, this would, would have been around 1959. Yeah. Uh, maybe a little bit, maybe a year later than that. But it, it just brought, you know, I knew him from movies like, you know, Son of Pale Face and the road movies he did with Bing. Yeah. You know, The Lemon Drop Kid, you know, a movie based on a character from a Damon Runyon short story. And... Uh, I don't know. I went to see that guy. You know, I don't know what I was expecting, but all of his gags were uh, had to do with uh, uh, alimony, divorce, <laughs> golf, uh, American politics. Uh, what a very reduced view of adult life you were going to get. Yeah. Well, you know, no, it was it was a, it was a whole it was a whole unknown universe to me. Now, you know, as a, as a child, I, I didn't understand most of his gags but I, I, I was just laughing along with everybody else that was in there uh i was the only 11 year old or nine year old however old i was when i went to see him and uh, but i was cracking up with the with the rest of them there was just something about the the the, the, the you know the, there was one guy in there that wasn't laughing bob hope bob hope <laughs> i just thought that was the coolest thing in the world you which know, makes it funnier that, but you know that is what a job that must be Yes. Making people laugh with a straight face. And so who did you see? I'm, I'm fairly sure in the book you talked about seeing Little Richard, I think. And I, 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 yeah. So when you, I think when you were 11. So huh? Yeah, I used, to, I used to see them at the uh, mainly at the Apollo Theatre, sometimes at the Palace. Yeah. Uh, uh, always at seated venues. Uh, but I saw a lot of people later on in the clubs, but those early gigs were put on by... Um, uh, Kennedy Street Enterprises under the auspices of uh, of the late great Don Arden. Oh, Don Arden, yes, of course. Uh, yeah, who's you know a <coughs> mythological figure uh, on his own, but uh, he he brought over Jerry Lee Lewis, Gene Vincent, Eddie Cochran, uh, Little Richard, the Everly Brothers, all all those uh, first wave Fats Domino, you know, you name it. I got to see Del Shannon. I got to see fantastic. Him. And uh, Dion, I'm sure I saw, uh, you know, I, I can't prove this. You know, I, I just wonder if I've taught myself into it because, uh, you know, I'm a fantastic, you know, I'm a, I'm a mad fan of uh, Dion de Mucci. Yes. I seem to recall I went to see him. He was on with Joey D and the Starlighters and Freddie, Freddie Boom Boom Cannon. Fantastic. Him, Palisades Park. Yeah. Remember Freddie Cannon. Sure you do. You're I do, I do. I'm trying to think what, how I'd react if I saw Little Richard at the age of 11. Can you remember what it was like, that show? Well, you know, it's, it, 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 I, I was jaded early on with rock and roll. I tell you, I saw the best right away. If I'd have seen Elvis, I probably would have never have left. Yeah, that downhill all the way. Absolutely. <laughs> That's incredible. What did Little Richard's show consist of? 
Oh, sensational. He had his own band. You know, it, there was no... Usually they had uh, sounds incorporated with a go-to, uh, you know, brass-heavy backing band. You, you yeah. Know, the sounds incorporated or Peter J and the Jaywalkers who would back, back up any solo act that was on. Yeah. But Richard brought his own band. How are you getting into these gigs at age 11, though? Who are you going with? Well, I used to go in the afternoon. No, the thing is, you know, I didn't do it in a gang. You know, if I'd have gone even with another person, we'd have got up to some sort of mischief that would yeah, have yeah, yeah. it. So I would, go, I would go in there in the afternoon when they were delivering the equipment and just sort of hang out and carry the odd... Oh, that's brilliant. Weed or roll of gaffer tape, you know. And then just so secrete and, yourself somewhere, yeah. So that anybody that threw me out would look, you know, bad. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, so, you know, as long as you as long as you were polite and helpful, nobody was going to sling you out. So that's how I did it, really. And uh, that's how I negotiated most of my end surprises, uh, even as a child. You know. Yeah. There's a lot in the book about the Beatles and Stones, and uh, at, at that stage, you kind of had to be kind of supposedly one or the other. So we're, 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 oh, yeah, yeah, the Beatles. We're, you were meant to be either Beatles or Stones, which is absurd. There's lots of things like that, isn't it, where you're forced yeah. to have a, you know, to make a choice. What, yes. What's the one a day? What's the, you know, yeah, Oasis and Blur. It's probably that's right. Now, isn't it? The whole rap scene. Clash or Pistols. Like, yeah, yeah, that's right, Clash or Bowie T-Rex, wasn't it? Was it? Yeah, yeah, I think it was, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, but th 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 those situations always uh, present themselves, don't they, for some reason? They do. I think, isn't it? It's a guy thing, right? Making yeah, it is. Of what's better, you know, you know, what's better than what, you know, rating things in list form formation, like, you know, it, it's, a, it's definitely a guy thing. Completely. Like, like the Ramones, isn't it, when they brought out that song, uh, uh, now I want to sniff some glue. And yeah. then they brought out a follow-up later on. Carbone and not glue. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. So, rating things, you know, not that, this. Yeah. You know, and that was it with the Stones, what it, Stones and the Beatles. Like, I, I also, the Stones were presented as the <laughs> bad boys, and in fact, the Beatles were the, were the real rebels, were they? Yeah, they, they were rolling drunks and taking dope with hookers. Yeah. Uh, while the Stones were swatting up for their... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. Oh, God. So a lot of the books about... Um, but well, that's the nature of mythology, that, isn't it? That's the nature of mythology. It doesn't matter. That's 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 the way the public sees it, and that's showbiz. That is showbiz entirely. A lot of your books about the the, the kind of uh, you're obsessed with clothes and wear really really interesting clothes really early on. So, were there any groups that you saw that you just that influenced the way you dressed? Sure, I haven't altered my look really since 1965. <laughs> I've, got, I've got a war, a, a wardrobe full of identical threads. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm not very adventurous. Which is which always struck me as, as, as blonde on blonde Bob Dylan, but I don't know if that was well, that anything nice, to do with it. Nice. No, the, the guy that got me that got me interested was uh you know uh was ron wood when he used oh, yeah. to be a guitar player with the uh, the birds the birds that's not the birds turn 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 mr tambourine man no no it's the birds with an eye wasn't it yeah yes yeah and uh you know and ron had that haircut you know that he still has today you know yeah that's but that was my haircut for years and uh to the point where i used to get mistaken for ron very often <laughs> in fact, and... Uh, and asked to sign his signature. I was, I was Ron Wood's decoy. He <laughs> wasn't always plain sailing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. <laughs> he wasn't always flavour of the month. You know, he blotted his copybook when he was on the source. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'd have to take the rap for all of that stuff. But... Uh, it, so it, who it, made them the biggest impression in terms of the way they looked then? Ron, 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 Ron was the one. Yeah. yeah. Well, I chose him because he was skinny with a, a bit of a beak. Yeah. So, and I could relate to that. Yeah. <laughs> For obvious reasons. <laughs> you know, and so I thought, there's a guy that looks glamorous. You know, he, he's skinny with a big nose and he looks great. So I took a lot of, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's the way I wanted to, that's the way I, you know, the way he dressed then. 
he was going around at a time. He was, I think they were they were kind of R and B band like most most. Of they them. were that's right. Yeah. When I say R and B, I mean you know Bo Diddley, Chuck Berry, yeah, Alan Wolf, <clears throat> and stuff like that. But um, uh, his brother Arthur had his own band as well. The, the Artwoods. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And I would see them later on after the the Don Arden shows and all of that. I started going to the basement venues all around Manchester, you know, the Oasis, the Young Frau, Heaven and Hell. Yeah. And especially the Twisted Wheel. Twisted Wheel. And you weren't allowed into, a, there was a dress code, wasn't there, right, at the New Century Hall? And you tried to get oh, into yeah, see Hendrix? Yeah, that was the time I went to see uh, Jimi Hendrix. At yeah. The New Hall, which was a place that was owned by the co-op. So they, they were quite, you know, they weren't, Okurants with the uh, sartorial trends. <laughs> Even then, it was slightly old-fashioned to to have a, a necktie as a as a, as a yeah. regulation piece of apparel, you know. But who yeah. thought that, that would mean anything to the fans of Jimi Hendrix? Like I said in the book, I reckon if Jimi had found out about that, he would have done his nut. He would completely done his nut. Yeah, that's absolutely. insane. But you know that was the uh, that was the clientele of the uh, new century hall. Yeah. Who did you see who made you want to? Because your first gigs, we'll get on to the first poetry gigs. Remember, the first gigs you did were were in bands, weren't they? As a as a kind of musician. Yeah, I'd, uh, yeah, I had a group. We were called the Mafia. We, the I was Mafia. At school when we started it, you know, it started out with the Stones and the Beatles. Which, Started rolling and uh, and um, you know we wanted some of that like complete. Yeah. I figured you know uh, I had, had one one of us could play. We had a, we had, I had a pal you know he'd been an RAF brat. Yeah, uh, a newcomer at Salford, you know, and he and he was one of the few people. Uh, I ever, if you saw somebody with any kind of guitar at this point, it was like it would stop traffic. He's got a guitar, you know. Whatever, yes, are you cheap? Plectrum acoustic, whatever, a guitar. Yeah, yeah. So this uh, this mate of mine, Mike, he's uh, sadly no longer with us. He had a red and black Dallas solid body guitar, you know, sort of modelled on a Stratocaster. You get splinters off the fingerboard, you know, <laughs> crap. But he could play. He could play like uh, you know, uh, like ringing a bell, as uh, as the great Chuck, Chuck said. Say. He was good at it. He was good yeah, at it. Yeah. Uh, so I figured I'd go for bass. You know, I could see I, I could see him doing chord shapes. You know, and I figured I, yeah, could, yeah. I could never get my fingers into those. You know, I gave up immediately. Yeah. Figured, but bass, I'm going to do that one string at a time. Yes. Oh, it'd be easy, but how wrong I was. The thing was, I had a conf I had a conflict there because they wanted me to sing. And back then, I hadn't heard my voice then. I'm fit, I, I quite fancied myself as something of a, of a, of a singer. And uh, hearing my voice back to me, you know, I wish I'd never never got a tape recorder. What, what were you meant to be doing? What sort of songs were I you doing? To, I was meant to sing, but I, I couldn't sing and play bass at the same time, you know. That's why I, I admire Macca so much. Oh, God, it's a skill, isn't it? You can't do that. It's counterintuitive. Oh, Mac, Mac is playing. Mac would play things that were offbeat and incredibly and complicated. How do you well, singing and still winking at girls in the front row. Incredible, very clever. You know, I've got to admit, you know, I must admire, I even admire Stig for that. The Stig singing, singing and playing bass at the same time. You know, it's not no, given, no, not it's, given to many people. No. So the only songs I could actually sing and play bass at the same time actually was uh, for obvious reasons. Hoochie coochie, man. All right, well, that's fairly basic. But you're not singing while you're playing, you know. Boom, 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 boom. Gypsy woman. Tell, tell my mother. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah. <laughs> that's that good. That could do. So I wrote loads of songs to the tune of Hoochie Coochie, man. That's great. <laughs> oh, Lord. So we, you know, we had a pretty limited palette on account of me. Yeah, yeah. A weak link. So that the even our drummer who later you know quickly joined the army and left the band, he, even he was really a gifted. He was quite a gifted drummer. It was unreal. He'd never touched a, a kit of drums before, but he bought one. We started looking at real cheap stuff, you know. And uh, he, remember that they used to do a, a kit called uh, Gigster, and it was actually, it was actually like a toy. <laughs> Anybody over the age of five would have looked like a giant. 
the crash symbols were the size of a pan lid. Cheek! <laughs> 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 but we, we did this show at the Freshers Ball at uh, Salford Tech Art Department. And uh, oh, God, I remember you writing about that and supporting Victor Brox. Yeah, Victor, Victor and his Brox. Soul Train. R.I.P. Train. Actually, uh, Victor died a fortnight ago. He did. Yeah, yeah, R.I.P. Yeah. He was great, Victor. We were re really impressed with, uh, with those guys. And they had the great Bruce Mitchell on the drums. Yeah. Yeah, 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 great, great band. The Mafia were one of those kind of, it's a bit like the, the, oh, the, yeah, the, the Spinal Tap, because I'm pretty sure that you're constantly changing your names. In yeah, order we, did, to, we had to. We, we went, were you we, the Vendettas or something? Or yeah, that's right. We, we, the thing, why we called ourselves the Mafia was that uh, we'd all been to see a movie called Pay or Die, starring Ernest Borgnine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The Lonely Honest Cop in Little Italy at that time, and it's set about 1911 or something like that. Yeah. Piece. And, uh, you know, about the big, the black hand, as they were called then. And uh, so we, we were like, uh, we like the way they dressed. <laughs> you know, there's Ernie, you know, the Ernest in his uh, cheap suit, you know, doing the right thing. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, but, but but it was the bad guys that, that, uh, that had the schmutzer. So we, we kind of aspired to that look and we figured we'll call ourselves the Mafia. And then, uh, but then we fi figured that, that our lack of success was down to the, un the unpopularity of the Mafia <laughs> and their works. So we figured, yeah, it's holding us back. Hold that name. It's that name. That's it's just the name that's the problem. There's yeah, nothing that, else. That, that, no, but none <laughs> Change of that. Play. Magically, <laughs> we'll have a career. Yeah, then, yeah, yeah, exactly that. So, so we've got to tone it down a bit. Okay, so we went for the Vendettas. Yeah. And it sounds like a, a scooter. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and played into that mob thing. You know, so uh, it's, it's a better name. Let's say it's a great name, isn't it? The Vendetta. The Vendetta is a great name, but it's not as great as the name which I think you finished up with at the end, which is just hilarious. Which was wasn't it the lovely flower? Oh yeah, that's that. that obviously, that's because of flower power. You know, and that's it's just such a hysterical <laughs> name. It's a great name. I made that one. So you'd yeah, seen yeah. what the move or somebody, didn't you? Yeah, just no, yeah, right. yeah, exactly. They were exactly the template. It was made up of uh, well, my, such as myself. Mods that were going a bit, not exactly hippie, but you know, a mohair suit with a floral shirt on. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, you know what I mean? And that yeah. was was enough <laughs> for for a, for a little while at the end of 1966. You know, that was just a kind of salute to California, but yeah, more than that, it wasn't a lifestyle thing or anything like that. So uh, yeah, they they were exactly that. That's uh, Ace Kefford. Ace, that's right. Yeah, 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 he would have been the template, especially for the guy that was starting his band off, <laughs> which was quite a long way from our house. So I used to, you know, um, I'd miss quite a few uh, rehearsals. Let's face it, I just wanted to punch a belt in a suit. Fair enough. Honestly, that's great. That was my reason for joining a band. Perfect. <laughs> But yeah, you also yeah, got in with I mean, Bernard Manning was the person bizarrely who gave you the big break as a he was doing the, your poetry. Wasn't that the first gig you did? Was at the embassy where it was called? Yeah, well, that, that, well, it's the first time I got cash money for doing what I do. Yeah, yeah. So how did you? What was it like auditioning for Bernard Manning? Well, he says he ran the club. Didn't quick, he? It was very quick. I went in the daytime as usual. I was quite res respectful. He was always hanging around the club, you know. Uh, yeah. Watering the beer down, and, <laughs> <laughs> and he would he would have said that about himself. Yeah, it was always it was always in the place. I knew that, you know. And uh, I'd, I'd, I'd reason about a fortnight before that, I'd done a a, a benefit uh, gig uh, for a, a left wing local paper, uh, and um, I told my dad who was you know, wasn't impressed. He said, he says, how much are you getting for that then? You know, so I said, well, you know, it's, a, it's what they call a benefit, Dad. You know, everybody's giving their services for free. He says, well, anybody would employ you under those conditions. Absolutely. <laughs> so I thought, That's well, sound advice. So, yeah, very sound. I never forgot it. I've only forgotten it once. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I thought, who would, who would impress my dad as a... As a um, uh, as a, a, the model of a Mancunian who has done well. Yeah, yeah. 
So I'm thinking there's only one guy, there's only one guy that fits that bill, Bernard Manning. Because everybody at my dad's age had been to the Embo at some point, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so so I went in to see Bernard anyway, and, uh, and he said, so I said, I'm a poet, Mr. Manning. I wonder if you'd give us a quarter of an hour, you know, on a quiet night, maybe. And he said, you know, there aren't any quiet nights. So, so I said, he says, anyway, he says, they don't like poetry here, kid. He was doing his best for, again, he was, he was coming from a place of, you know, he cared about me. Said, they don't like poetry here, kid. Half of them can't fucking read. <laughs> so I said, well, it's nothing too hoity-toity, Mr. Manning, you know. Now, I knew that Bernard had worked in the world of ballroom dancing, mecca ballrooms, because he started out in show business as a vocalist with the Oscar Rabin dance band. Yeah. So he would do all like Brooke Benton stuff and things like that. He was the go-to guy for the more edgy R and B flavored stuff. You know, they all they, you, every dance band had three three singers and two guys and a and a woman who 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 took solo spots but could sing in close harmony with each other. You know, it was a traditional thing. And uh like in the Joe Losso Orchestra, for instance, where yeah. Elvis Costello's Elvis's dad. Elvis's dad, that's right, Teclan, yeah. He was the balladeer, and they had yeah. another guy, Larry Gretton, that uh, did the other kind of stuff, and Ron yeah. Brennan, and they, and they operated as a close harmony trio. And uh, the Oscar Rabin band uh, was no exception, and Bernard was the guy that handled, as I say, the more sort of punchy stuff. But he could croon as well, he could do a, he could do a romantic. Yeah. He was a gifted singer. You know, you don't get to be in the Oscar Rabin orchestra uh, without knowing. But how did you convince yeah. him to take you on? Anyway, so I said, so I knew he was familiar with the world of uh, ballroom dancing. So I give him a clip from a poem I'd recently written called Salome. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, set in the Rick. which is now an alternative rock and roll venue. But then. Oh, yeah, the, she fell off the, the stilettos. Store. Yeah. It was the, the so that's the line I gave him. I gave him that couplet, you know, when it, it's it, it, it finishes in a punch up, yeah, at the Ritz at this dance hall, Mecca dance hall. So uh, when the ambulances came, she was lying on the deck. She fell off her stiletto wheels and broke her fucking neck. He went, that that'll do. Yeah, <laughs> that's all it takes. <laughs> we'll say there's a fuck in there. The audience are gonna love it. it. The F word clinched it. Absolutely. And that's been my MO. So, what did you learn from the, <laughs> your experiences at the? Uh, you must. That's a pretty fast well, learning. With, I've got to be honest and say that I was met with the poet's worst enemy, not hostility, indifference. Oh right, okay. If they start talking to each other, you've lost it. There's no way back. And of course, I didn't know about the showbiz tricks back then. You know, I was a newcomer, so I figured. So, what are the showbiz tricks? That's well, pretty, well, well, I thought they're not listening. Raise the volume. Worst thing you can do, you got like counterintuitively there. If they if they can't hear you, they'll tell each other to shut up. So drop the volume. That's good. Drop the volume. And sooner or later be shh, shh. You know what I mean? But I was new raw. I panicked. Did you did you have an arsenal of uh uh, of kind of uh, of responses prepared for hecklers. Do, what, did you pe did people heckle you? I didn't get heckled in there. They didn't care enough. Yeah. To even heckle me, you know, I was just out of their range of previous experience. <laughs> the hard <laughs> lesson. The hard lesson, and I'm glad I got it away early on because after that, everything was a doddle. Yeah. It then was a dull punk rock. People say to me, you know, what was it like with all them bottles and spitting and, you know, and uh, the hostility of punk rock. You know, it held no terrors for me. Not after, not after the, not after the wall of indifference I'd had to scale at the embassy club. <laughs> you know, and if, if there's trouble at your gigs, it gets written up and you know publicity. I don't care what they say about me as long as they spell it C L A R K E. Yeah. <laughs> So I can remember seeing you, I think it was the Rainbow. I can't remember, I was supporting the only yeah, ones. I did the Rainbow with the only yeah. ones, that's right. Yeah, I think it was, and uh, it was fantastic. And you were, on, you were kind of on the punk circuit the whole time. Can you remember any of the kind of support slots you did that were particularly extraordinary? Uh, no, I, I mean, I've, 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 I've appeared with the best, really. 
Yeah. I think the one, I think that maybe the one that impressed me, I love the only ones. And I, I used to do, I used to do shows with them all the time, the class pistol, public, yeah. public image. But I enjoyed that. My first, my first really meaningful tour for me, after the Elvis Costello Richard Hell uh, tour, would, would have been uh, with uh, Linson Quasi Johnson. We, oh, yeah. Poetry wise, that's when it got like, we were the hottest ticket in town back then, and it was a it was a great, very successful tour of that. And uh, I remember it really, you know. It was a, it was but a punk of, crowds were generally of, very accepting, and very welcoming, weren't they? I mean, they didn't give you a hard time at all. You fitted in perfectly. It didn't last long getting a hard time. Like I say, you know. After, yeah. After Bernard and Punk. <laughs> Absolutely. It was now, a you breeze. Know, I mean, now it's you know, it's a doddle now. Great. Not, not exactly a doddle, you know, it's, it's a job, but one I like. And, and, you know, when you're selling out large halls, you know, and the tickets aren't cheap, you know, who would spend that money just to give somebody a bad turn? Yeah. But you, they were, I guess you want a few of my responses. You know, yes, that's right, sir, drink up. Last time I saw a mouth like that, it had a hook in it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any more of that now, get in touch with your superiors. Find me anyone. Anyone will do. That's right. <laughs> uh, what was the other one? I can't hear you, mate. Your mouth's full of shit. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that's the one that's on on record, isn't it? Um, what others were there? Oh, there were, there were a million of them. There's a mil million of them, but I can't call them to mind right now. So what yeah, can I mean, we... I, thank God, thank God almighty. I, they're extraneous. You know, I, I, yeah. I, uh, I don't need... So I don't get hecklers. No. What can we expect from the from the the upcoming tour? Then I mean, are there any things that you you always play? Are there any that the, 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 the tables would go over if you didn't do Chicken Town or Beasley sure, Street or whatever? Town, that's my own personal favourite because it's done such great business for me. Really, yeah. Being on the back credits of the penultimate episode of The Sopranos, unbelievable. That's right. Of course, yeah, it was unbelievable. Fabulous. Yeah. And uh, so, God, yeah, that, that was quite uh, quite career changing, wasn't it? I think so. Yeah, yeah. And it was just when I started being able to get back into the states as well. You know, I was sort of I wasn't an, an entirely unknown factor. Yeah, just because of that. <clears throat> in fact, when I when I started getting back at it, I was doing a, a show in Los Angeles, and uh, and uh, there was a kid there with a the phone. He's saying, "Hey, you're the guy that did." He's, he's a kind of Hispanic kid. And he said, "Wait, I gotta tell my gotta tell my buddy that you, that you're on here." So he's uh, so he's he's getting up, I'm looking over his shoulder at his phone, and uh, and there, and there comes a picture of uh, Wilco, the late Wilco Johnson, and I said, "Hey, it's like that that is a he's a pal of mine." Now I don't have Netflix or anything like that. I'm strictly a TV free view guy, and uh, but I know I know about it, and. Uh, because my daughter's a big fan, and he says, uh, so I think, yeah, yeah, okay. that guy's a friend of mine. He says, you know him? And I'm, yeah, yeah, he's a great guitar player. And he, he says, he plays the guitar? <laughs> well, famous for being the, the mute executioner in Game of Thrones, you know. And I, and I was like, oh, like, you know, yeah, well, well what else? And... Uh, you know, he's, he was world famous for, for for that, more so than any any record he ever made. I imagine. You know, that's it. Couldn't believe that I knew this guy. Well, it must be weird that you did an entire career and there's one little tiny. Yeah, moment, I know. You know. Unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah, I but, know. You know, that showbiz. That showbiz is precisely. So that we use the end by saying with the the tourists coming up, I think it's April, June, July, whatever. But we usually am asking people what the, what the greatest gig, the greatest show they ever saw was. Can you can you think what the, the most immortal memory that you have of anybody? Well, that Dion. Dion. Whether it happened or not. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Let's just imagine it did. Yeah, in the playground of my imagination, that's the best show I've ever seen. That's great. You could, you could write any script you want. Fantastic. Yeah. John, it's lovely to talk to you. It's so great. We'll plug the dates. As I say, it's the um, it's the I Want to Be Yours tour and it starts in April around the UK and uh, it's very nice to talk to you. Thanks for thanks for, for coming on board. Brilliant. Pleasure, Mark. Excellent.